Some of us love programming. Programming is a skill that is very much in demand, and if you are a truly great programmer, you will never be unemployed, unless, of course, you voluntarily choose to. Some of us program because it's a fulfilling activity in itself. Even if we didn't have a lucrative full-time job as a software developer, we would still want to program in our spare time, just because it's so creative and enjoyable. It has been said appropriately that programming is the most fun you can have with your clothes still on. So, if you like programming, how do you become a great programmer? Welcome to Frank Stajano Explains. I am a full professor in the computer science department of the University of Cambridge. I run my own company and I have also enjoyed a previous life in industry working for Google, Toshiba, AT&T, Oracle and Olivetti. So I know a thing or two about professional software development and how to learn the program. I recently received this question from an anonymous viewer of the channel. Hi, Professor. Hi. What do you think of learning one language extremely well or learning a few to a decent level? For example, Please can you advise on whether one should learn Python really fluently and then learn C++ really fluently or have Python basics intermediate nailed down and then straight onto the same for C++. Well, as is often the case, it's impossible to give the correct answer without knowing the background of the person who's asking me. How junior or senior are you? Can you already program? If you can, then in how many languages? How big is the longest program you've ever written? Are you able to reverse a linked list? Can you do it both iteratively and recursively? And perhaps most importantly, what are your goals? Where do you want to get to ultimately? Why do you want to learn C++ really fluently? Do you have a practical thing you want to do that you can only do once you are fluent in C++? Did someone tell you that fluency in C++ will be the ticket to get your dream job? Or is it an intellectual achievement on its own that will make you proud? In summary, what's the point of all this? Where are you starting from and why are you doing it? Because before figuring out how to do it, it would be good to help you establish if it's the right thing for you to do, and whether you have sufficient motivation to stick through the hard times, and whether you would still enjoy doing it after the initial honeymoon, let's say, and whether it's worth the investment for you, and so forth. I'm not trying to live your life for you and take your decisions for you, I'm just helping you ask yourself the right questions before making a big commitment, because it is one. So, given that I don't know any of the answers to the above questions about you, I'm going to rephrase your question slightly and talk about how to become a great programmer regardless of language. And I won't assume you have much programming experience, but I will assume you have dabbled in programming to a sufficient extent to have figured out that you really love programming and you want this skill to become the backbone of your professional career. I hope that I'll be answering your actual question along the way as a side effect, and that would be something along the lines of what roadmap should I follow to become fluent in my favorite programming language. And hopefully I'll also be answering similar questions that other young people watching the channel might have, whatever their background, provided that they share this love of programming and this aspiration of becoming a great programmer. The first and most important prerequisite for becoming a great programmer is what I said at the start. You must enjoy programming, really enjoy it. It must be the thing you would do anyway as its own reward. I remember when I got my first programming job and every one of my colleagues had their own Sun workstation with a huge, for the time, CRT monitor, about this size. And I was going to get one too. I mean, this size and this size, before the LCDs. Now, I thought I was in paradise. It kind of felt weird that they would even pay me, as I would have almost paid them to be there and play with that kind of stuff, which I couldn't afford on my own. If you aspire to be great at programming, it has to be something that comes from within, an unstoppable urge, something that really gives you pleasure and satisfaction when you do it. Now, of course, programming is not always rosy and enjoyable and creative. Much of it, much of the time, programming is actually difficult and frustrating. Uh, as a professional programmer, you'll have to spend a lot of time and lots of, you know, very long evenings into the night finding where your bugs are and consider yourself lucky when at least you know for sure from some bug reports, that there are bugs for you to find, because the most insidious are the bugs that are there, but you don't know about, especially if they are security bugs. But that's another story. Let's not get too sidetracked. But the point I'm making is that becoming a great programmer is actually a pretty difficult endeavor, and you need to have some natural talent for it, which you then need to cultivate and enhance, but you also need a great deal of motivation that you will want to continue to be a programmer, even when it gets really hard and discouraging and unrewarding and frustrating and so on. So, much as some of us enjoy programming as an intellectually stimulating creative endeavor, programming would in fact be an empty and somewhat pointless activity if it didn't solve some actual problem. So, one of the best ways to learn is to find a problem to solve and try to solve it 
with however much you know about the programming language you know and push yourself to the limit if you still can't solve the problem is it because you can't drive the language well enough is it because there are some language features that you can't use yet if so that should be a stimulus to learn more about the language to finally dig into that chapter that you originally just skimmed and so on on the other hand possibly at a later stage uh, you may encounter certain problems that the programming language you're familiar with is not very well suited to tackle even a master of that language would not be able to do much because of some inherent limitation. The language it just wasn't designed for that. And it's important that you get to the point where you can recognize that by yourself and where you can understand in practice what are the limits of the language you're using. For example, some languages will be unsuitable for very fast execution, where you have to do plenty of operations in real time on, uh, say, every frame of video. And if you don't finish them quickly enough, then the next frame will arrive and you will fall behind and you will never have any hope of catching up. Maybe some other programming languages are unsuitable for handling very large projects and the organization of code becomes a mess and it's difficult to catch trivial, mi trivial mismatches between one part of the code and another when the code base becomes too large and you'd want to catch those things at compile time but some some uh, languages are too dynamic and don't have uh, static checks and don't let you do that maybe some other languages are unsuitable for proving properties of the code or for introspection or for higher level abstractions and so forth so but this is the kind of insights that you can only have if you have been exposed to different programming paradigms if you have seen more than just the one language you're familiar with today so there is much to be said for learning several unrelated and radically different languages in your first few years on your path to becoming a great programmer someday and to gain some experience applying those different programming paradigms to actual problems to be solved so that you can see in practice where you are hitting those limitations of the specific individual languages of course at some level every language is equivalent to every other language in the sense that they can all compute the same stuff and you may have heard that they're all equivalent to a turing machine this is a fundamental result of theoretical computer science called the church turing thesis but as you know while theory and practice are in theory the same in practice they are not and of course not all languages are equivalent in practice otherwise there would be no point in inventing so many different ones douglas hofstadter said it best in his masterpiece gödel escherbach which is one of my favorite books of all time he says the space of all possible programs is so huge that no one can have a sense of what is possible each higher level language is naturally suited for exploring certain regions of program space. Thus the programmer, by using that language, is channeled into those areas of program space. He is not forced by the language into writing programs of any particular type, but the language makes it easy for him to do certain kinds of things. As Hofstadter says, there is an immensely multidimensional space of all the programs that could conceivably be written, and each programming language is designed to let you explore most comfortably a certain region of that space. And the regions do, of course, overlap to some extent, especially for small-scale problems. It follows that to become a great programmer, you do need some experience with multiple programming languages and, more importantly, with multiple programming paradigms so that you will be able to understand what the most appropriate language is for a given real-world problem to be solved, which region is it in. And if you're learning several languages, they had better be languages that don't overlap too much otherwise you're basically solving the same problems using different syntax and that's it a new question you asked should i first become very fluent in one language and only then move to another or should i just become good enough and then move on well again there's no single correct answer for everyone but if you are a beginner programmer then it's probably a good idea to learn the basics of several languages before specializing on one if nothing else, because no one can guarantee that when you first got into programming and knew very little about the subject, you chose the best language for you to specialize in. It should also be noted that becoming a true expert in a programming language, what we call in the trade a language lawyer, someone who can cite chapter and verse of the official specification when there's the slightest doubt about how the language should behave in some obscure circumstance, well, becoming a language lawyer is a very time-consuming endeavor and possibly a non-terminating one. So it's probably best not to make this the first thing you do, otherwise you might end up doing nothing else. And I said a non-terminating one because programming languages are not static objects. They evolve. Their definition gets updated periodically. And if you are going to be an expert, then you need to keep up to date. I remember in the late 1980s, I started dabbling with C++, not very seriously initially. I bought the Borland C++ compiler and I played around with it a bit on my PC that was running MS-DOS. Then when I got my first programmer job in a few years later, in the early 90s, at work we used Unix workstations, not PCs. And I can't exactly remember whether the C++ compiler we used was from Sun or GNU or maybe digital, I don't know. Anyway, 
I bought myself a copy of the newest edition of B.R. Struthrup's C++ book. It was the second edition, had been recently published, and I went through it religiously starting from page one. But to my dismay, plenty of the language features described in the book were still not implemented or were unsupported in the compilers we had. And this caused me immense frustration, okay? I wanted to run the language properly at last, but there was a mismatch between what the book said and what the compiler did. And I wasn't anywhere near an expert, and I just uh, was thoroughly confused. Of course, the compiler makers caught up in due course, and Struthrup on his side kept improving the language, inventing new features and writing new books and so on and so on, and compilers had to support the new language features as well. And this cycle repeated several times, and now a good 30 years later, we are at a stage where the specification and the major implementations are finally pretty much in sync, and they've been for a while. And when a new C++ standard is released about every three years, then the compilers are ready for it pretty much, pretty much immediately. But it wasn't always like that, and it won't always be like that for other languages, other languages you will work with in the course of your career, maybe languages that haven't been invented yet. Okay, so you have another 40 years ahead of you. So the point I'm making here is that to be an expert in a particular programming language is a major career investment. So it's one that you should probably do when you have a bit of experience about which language you should invest in. And you have found some of the answers to the questions I asked you at the start. And when I say invest, I'm not talking about buying the compiler with your pocket money. I'm talking about how many years of intense study are you going to put in. As a great programmer, you will have to be extremely fluent and proficient in at least one language so that you can translate your ideas directly to working code without having to look things up in the reference manual. Or, or these days, people don't go to the reference manual, they just look them up on Stack Overflow. Anyway, uh, you have to know at least one language well enough that if you know what you want to do, then you also immediately know how to express it in that language without having to look anything up. And that's a bare minimum. And that's perhaps 75% of the way to being a language lawyer. Most great programmers eventually do become language lawyers in their language of choice, but it's a status that you have to maintain. You have to work at maintaining. If you were a language lawyer in some language X 10 years ago, and you didn't keep up to date with that knowledge, then now you won't be one anymore. And besides that, you will need familiarity with other programming paradigms and other languages so that you are able to assess whether the language you're most familiar with is the right tool for the job, as we were saying earlier. And after you learn your first few languages, then it's easy to learn new ones, but it's difficult, it's still difficult to keep the details of all of them in your head at the same time, because you know things are so similar that it's easy to confuse them. So you'll find plenty of great programmers who know and understand a dozen programming languages or more, but even they are only really comfortable and fluent in maybe a couple of languages at a time. Now, being a great programmer is not simply about being able to write great code by yourself. If you're going to be a great programmer in the real world and you're going to earn a six-digit salary from one of the fangs, then the reason you'll be admired and rewarded as a great programmer is because you are able to understand and solve difficult problems. And these will generally involve finding obscure bugs in undocumented software written by other people who have by now even left the company. And that's a lot harder than writing your own software. Uh, it's really difficult. One way to solve this problem in theory is to throw the old code away and rewrite it all yourself properly in the vain hope that your version will be clean and understandable and documented and bug free. But that's kind of cheating. And in the real world, you usually can't afford the luxury to throw the old stuff away. And it probably wouldn't work that way anyway, because you would just introduce your own new bugs. So you have to acquire the ability to read other people's code. Sometimes other people's disgusting code, really disgusting code. You have to be able to make sense of it, fix it, and make improvements to it without breaking other stuff. And that's a lot harder, but a lot more mature than just being able to write decent code yourself in isolation, where you have the luxury of using only the features of the language you really understand and are comfortable with uh, using a style, a programming style that you like. Now, gaining this ability will take years, but I'm just helping you visualize the long path ahead on your way to becoming a truly great programmer. And that's why when I'm marking my students' projects, if someone extends an existing body of code, other things being equal, I tend to rate their efforts more highly than when someone just writes everything from scratch, starting with a blank editor. It's worth more to me. Nobody likes to work with other people's rubbish code, so when you do get a job as a developer, I recommend you dig into the company's code base, select one library that is crucial to the core business, but that your colleagues tend to stay clear of because it's poorly documented and maybe uh, untidily written, and you then dig into it. You study the source code in your spare time. You make it your secret personal project to become the expert on it. Very few people will want to get their hands dirty with it, so you will have very little competition. 
And then at some point, it will transpire that you are the person who can work with that stuff, who can answer questions about that stuff, who can fix bugs in that stuff, add new features to that stuff, refactor that stuff to make it go 10 times faster. And if you're able to pull this off, then you will earn enormous respect from your colleagues and your superiors. As a professional developer, you will have to learn to work with other people's code, not just by maintaining the code of people who are no longer there, but also by interacting with other developers in a project that is larger than what a single programmer could develop in isolation. So if you want to become a great programmer, you should only ever work in companies or institutions where you can find other great programmers. The difference in productivity between an OK programmer and a great programmer is astonishing, it's the order of a factor of maybe 1,000. So there are few better ways to become great than to witness true greatness firsthand. If some of your colleagues are great programmers, then when you have a programming problem and you ask them, they'll probably have a great solution in their head. But depending on how you ask them and depending on the kind of the competence you exhibit in the way you phrase your question, uh, they may give you their answer with contempt or not even bother talking to you. And this might force you to mm, think a lot harder before asking them the next question and be much more prepared with the reasoned arguments that a great programmer expects before you dare speaking to them. If you survive this process, you will become a much better programmer yourself. And eventually, the great programmers you know will treat you as one of their peers. They start respecting you. Interacting with great programmers is not always easy, actually, because to a first approximation, they are all somewhere on the autism spectrum, okay? And they find it easier to talk to predictable machines than to those emotionally fickle human beings. And I'm caricaturing, of course, and I can afford to do that because I'm a programmer myself. But there's a grain of truth in that. Okay, but actually many great programmers are wonderful human beings. And I hope that when you become one yourself, you won't forget these words and you will be kind to the more junior people when they reach out to you for advice. Of course, we could keep talking about this stuff all day, but I hope that what we said so far addresses your question to some extent. If anyone viewing this video has any further questions about computer science, about programming, about learning, about learning computer science, or any of the other topics that are relevant to this channel, then stick them in the comments below, mentioning the words mineral water, so that I know you made it this far. Like and subscribe if you want more videos like this one. Happy hacking, and I hope you become a great programmer one day.